Hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we're going to have an in-depth analysis of the different methods of measuring ageing. And so this kind of comes under the branch of a new term I came across called biohorology, which is the science of measuring the passage of time in living systems. So currently there are different ways that we can try and measure age, and so in this video we'll look at how you can do that why you'd want to do that and what the kind of goal for an ageing clock would actually be. And then at the end we'll look at the accuracy and utility of these different clocks and the potential future development of these clocks. And so the references I've used for this video I've linked down in the description for further reading if you're interested. So firstly let's talk about what actually is ageing. So one way you can define ageing is the progressive deterioration of an organism over time. However, what is becoming apparent is that this deterioration is a dynamic and non-linear process, which means that certain events don't happen all at the same time or in a succinct order. And this makes ageing really challenging to study. So in terms of defining ageing, you can define age by a chronological age and a biological age. So chronological age is easier to understand and it kind of simply is the amount of time that has passed since you were born. But biological age is a bit more complicated and this is mainly because it's used in different contexts. But one way of thinking about it is a time dependent component of an organism's overall health. Now determining chronological age is much easier than determining biological age. So what are the different ways of trying to estimate someone's biological age? Well, in previous videos, I've talked about an epigenetic clock and a proteomic ageing clock, which we'll also talk about in this video again. But in addition, we'll also look at the use of telomere length as a way of measuring ageing and also gene expression and elaborate a bit more on biochemical compounds that you can get from blood samples. But before I describe those in any more detail and assess the differences in the accuracy and the utility, why do we even care about trying to measure biological age? Well, there are kind of two main reasons. Firstly, from a scientist's perspective, by having these uh, different measurements, you can actually quantify and define ageing and try to understand the ageing process better. And then secondly, having these estimations can also be used to evaluate the efficacy of juroprotective interventions. And so obviously, especially with this latter one, you want to have an agreement on what method of measuring this biological age is because otherwise certain interventions they could bias the interpretation of the results and so the idea is we need to get some kind of general agreement but this is obviously easier said than done and so what we really want like the kind of dream for an aging biomarker so to speak is to fulfill certain criteria and so firstly you want to have something that's a better predictor of lifespan than chronological age and also it must be something that it can monitor a basic process that actually underlies the ageing process. But this is hard at the moment because we don't fully understand the ageing process. And then thirdly, we want this biomarker test to be something that can easily be tested repeatedly across someone's lifespan. And then lastly, it also should, well, it'd be good for it to work in model organisms so it can be tested before applied to humans. And so getting to these biomarkers really depends on us being able to understand this dynamic non-linear aging process. And so we've spoken before about the hallmarks of aging, which is probably one of the best ways so far to be able to understand the aging process. But there's also different theories of aging. So the reductionist theory is that there could potentially be a single factor that gives rise to all these distinctive aging phenotypes. Currently there isn't any that has been found, however I think this kind of mindset is somewhat similar to what I read in Davis and Clare's book Lifespan, where he talks about ageing being the loss of information that is above all these different hallmarks of ageing. And then the second approach is the idea that ageing is just a multitude of simultaneous damage accumulation processes. And so currently I think this theory of ageing is preferred. However, what is needed is a consensus so that everyone is studying the same aging process. And so basically it comes down to semantics. It depends how you define aging. And so we're trying to find what this aging process is and we try and define it by these hallmarks. And so aging could be a common denominator of these different hallmarks for the majority of the hallmarks. So not all of them, for example, this green ring may not be 
so correlated with the aging process. However, the alternative situation is that actually there's even less overlap between these different hallmarks and whatever causes the aging phenotype. But what you can do is try and understand which of these hallmarks are more important and give them like an age score and link them further to the development of aging. Now this made more sense in my head than when I tried to explain it, but I hope you somewhat understand the idea that I'm trying to get to. But the idea I was trying to get to is that the more important the hallmark is to aging, the greater weight of that score is to the overall age score. Anyway, let's just move on. The last thing we need to briefly mention before we look at these different biological biological clocks is that a lot of them depend on the training data and how they were determined in the first place and then how they can be used to predict someone's biological age. And so in theory, developing these clocks relies on having healthy disease-free patients whereby their chronological age should pretty much be their biological age. And so it goes without saying that each of these different clocks are going to depend on how they actually defined a healthy disease-free patient and also it's going to depend on the genders used and the geographical locations of these patients in the first place. So what are these different biological clocks then? Well firstly there's one clock that could potentially be developed by looking at the length of telomeres. Now telomeres are repetitive sequences that are found at the ends of DNA sequences and so as a cell divides these sequences shorten and this is one of the hallmarks of aging. Telomeres are protective for a cell so when they decline in length they put the cell at risk and so the cell can either undergo cellular senescence which is one of the hallmarks of aging as well where it's, the cell stops dividing or if a cell manages to evade this process it could lead to cancer development. But the bottom line is is that potentially by looking at the length of these telomeres you could be able to estimate someone's age because it indicates that that cell has been around for longer, it's been dividing for longer. And so given the caveat that telomeres can also be extended by a protein called telomerase, we're going to ignore that for now because generally human telomerase is inactive in somatic cells. But even if we just focus on the somatic cells, which are basically any cell in the body which isn't a reproductive cell, there are still issues with assessing telomere length as correlating with biological age. And that's firstly because there's different ways of trying to measure the length. And based on different studies, there's been different sample sizes, different age distributions, and so multiple studies show different correlations between telomere length and biological age. Also, they don't take into account telomere damage. We talked about this a bit more in my previous video, but effectively there can be length independent ways of telomeres also being associated with cellular senescence. And so that could actually also be masking the signal of the length and its correlation to biological age, which is also why different studies give different results, potentially. So what about an epigenetic clock? Well, I spoke about this before in a previous video, which I recommend you watch, obviously, but I'll go over some key points again. So what is epigenetics? So epigenetics is all the non-genomic information storage in cells. So I think um, it's easy to understand DNA and DNA sequence, which is the series of nucleotides A, G, T and C within the nucleus of your cell. However, DNA isn't just DNA in the nucleus, it's actually tightly wrapped around proteins called histone proteins, which help to compact the DNA into the nucleus. And the level of compaction within the nucleus varies, so some regions are more compacted than others. And part of this comes down to the association of marks that can be added to DNA and to histone proteins. And one of these marks is methylation, and the impact of adding these marks to either DNA or to histone proteins is that they can alter the compaction and altering the compaction can therefore potentially cause genomic instability but also it can lead to changes in gene expression. In particular, regions that become less compacted could result in an increased expression of retrotransposons which are normally silent in the genome and this has been linked with aging. So bottom line, most of these marks are actually quite dynamic. They can be taken away and added and in particular, studies have shown that DNA methylation marks change during aging. Many of these changes have been found at so-called CPG sites, and basically what this means are sites where you see a C next to a G, and it's the C, the cytosine, that actually receives this methylation mark. 
And then these beta marks can be detected and analysed for their presence. And so a lot of work that's been done on epigenetic clocks has been done in the lab of Steve Horvath. And in 2013, he had quite a seminal paper that showed that 353 of these CPG sites had methylation changes that enabled them to predict chronological age with a 2.9 year median error. And this could also be done in cells that either had stopped dividing or cells that continuously divide. And so if you're interested in his work, you'll find a recent TED talk that he gave where he actually mentioned that now they're working on developing a universal epigenetic clock for all mammals. But bottom line, by looking and analysing these different CPG sites and for methylation presence, you can try and determine biological age. But there's some key questions associated with the use of DNA methylation as a clock. Firstly, what aspect of ageing does this actually reflect? For example, why do certain epigenetic sites show such a high correlation with biological age and others don't? Secondly, there's been multiple developments of these methylation clocks and they use different sites. And so these are equally good, so the question is why? And maybe there's some redundancy, but the idea is there's a lot of questions that hopefully at some point we can understand. Anyway, moving on, the third way potentially of measuring ageing is by looking at gene expression patterns. And so in terms of understanding why changes in expression might be associated with ageing kind of goes back to what we've been talking about in terms of the epigenetic clock, whereby the alterations of these marks can result in changes in gene expression. However, the technology at the moment means that this, there hasn't been a clock developed so far, but it has potential. And so the last clock we'll look at is the use of biological compounds that can be detected in blood. And so this includes things like proteins, as I discussed before in that video, which you should check out because I think it's some of my finest work. But other compounds found in blood include things like calcium, cholesterol, glucose and urea. And so there was a paper that came out in 2016 that developed a clock that used 42 different features. and. The good thing about blood is that it's very accessible and quite easy to get and to analyse. And so the this clock's been updated and so there was another publication that came out in 2018. And so this clock was slightly less accurate but it required the use of much less factors. And so some of these factors, in addition to the blood chemicals, include things such as sex and geographical location and these two were actually really important for determining the the age, which is very interesting. So now we've looked at the different clocks. Which one is the best? Well, there's improvements that can be made in all of the clocks, but if we plot each of them onto a graph of accuracy versus utility, we can try and get an idea of where we're currently at in determining and predicting biological age. So kind of at the bottom of the list is telomeres, and higher up in terms of accuracy is DNA methylation, which is kind of the the hot uh, clock at the moment. But, you know, close up is a blood test, which due to their utility also show great promise. And also the transcriptome has potential if we can use more deep learning methods to understand the huge range of changes that occur within the gene expression. One interesting option would be to use a range of these different tests and see them complement each other. However, that comes with the associations of increased cost and decreased practicality. So hopefully this has given you a good insight into the different ways we can try and estimate biological age and as always, thanks for listening.